In part two of our series on the Oklahoma City bombing, we'll be taking a look at the life of Timothy McVeigh. We'll discuss his relatively normal upbringing, his fascination with guns, his time in the military, and how he came to believe that a civil war against the federal government was inevitable. We'll also take you through the web of friends and associates McVeigh met while traveling the country and attending gun shows. Some of these people may have had more to do with the bombing than you're aware. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you thought this week was the last episode of the Oklahoma City bombing series, stick around. Ian fucked up the outline again. This is Necronomapod. What impact did it have on you actually being there and looking at it? Shaken, disillusioned, uh, angered uh, that that could happen in this country where our core beliefs are freedom and liberty. And what did you do to these people? You deprived them of life, liberty, and property. You didn't guarantee those rights. You deprived them of them. The thing that hits me the hardest about that is the CS gasp. Just knowing what it does and knowing as, a, as some adults can barely breathe because of it. When I saw it introduced into a building for kids like that, it just, the emotions it brings up make me speechless. So Dave, what would you say is your favorite like go-to vodka? We don't talk enough vodka on this show. Hmm. We like, normally buy Tito's. I don't drink a lot of vodka. My wife does. But yeah, Tito's normally. Tito's is good. Yeah. Ian, what about you? Yeah, I don't really like vodka at all. But what is in my house usually is either Tito's or Grey Goose. Goose. Ian's a gin man. He's Hey, yeah. I'm a gin man as well. I'm with him on that. What's your favorite gin, Ian? Uh, I like Beef Eater a lot. Mm. Beef Eater. Bombay Sapphire. Bombay is good. I only like Tanqueray. Mm. Look at that. We went three different gins. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> who knew yeah. all right i always like stoli vodka it's cheap it's like it's about 20 bucks eh. but i think it tastes better than it than it goes for yeah you're so like kamchaka eight dollar vodka oh boy <laughs> it's like you're rubbing alcohol <laughs> when you're in college you can get drunk for four bucks you just go buy that and like a, a gallon of fruit punch yeah. what's there's one level below that too pop off is that what it's called pop off or it's a gallon oh, like, yeah. you know, five bucks oh. it's in a plastic container yeah, exactly I, don't know. I like vodka. I just don't drink it that much. It's great to mix. I don't love vodka. It's it's the perfect mixer, though. You don't really taste it with anything. It is. Yeah. Nice it's whiskey's still best. You know what else I like is Finlandia. That's good. It's a good uh, mid-range, cheaper cheaper vodka. Yeah. It's good. Smirnoff, no good. I don't like Smirnoff no? vodka. They're the ones that have like 15, 16 different flavors. Like you see like the rainbow of colors yeah, in the liquor yeah, store. That's not good. I don't need all that, that jazz. A lot of the more expensive stuff's not great. Like... uh. Like They're, Grey Goose, like Grey Goose is terrible. That's what Ian just said he likes. <laughs> Sorry, it's not good. <laughs> no, I didn't say I like it. I just said that's what's in my house uh, a lot of times. Is it Sky? I don't like Sky. I like Sky. I, I think that one's a little bit, I don't know, rubbing alcoholy. I mean, you know, I want bourbon, so I'm not really the expert on vodka, but I, okay. Hey, I'm just mixing up the conversation. Yeah, we talk about I like all it this stuff enough. So I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on vodka. Let us know out there what you like or not. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> I'm just making small talk with the audience, trying to connect here. <laughs> he's going to ignore your replies anyway, so he's like, mm, <laughs> delete, <laughs> delete. Fucking throwaway comment. He doesn't give a fuck what you think. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the fun we're allowed to have today. Back Bullshit. To, uh, I'm like uh, four whiskeys in. I'm ready for a good time tonight. What whiskey are you drinking tonight? Crown. Hey, it's the good stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's not the good stuff. There's people now cussing me out, talking, you know, bourbon. Love I like such. Crown. I love Crown too. But you don't like the Crown Black. I love the Crown Black. Don't like the Crown Black. Yeah. I like all the crown. I don't like the flavored crown. The fruit, like the the peach and the vanilla and the I apple. No. It's truly disgusting. I don't want anything like that. Right. I want whiskey flavored whiskey. Yep. I don't disagree. Crown Royal. All right. And um, I got a Foster's on tap here to crack open in a second. Man, you're going all in on the show. Yeah, tonight. absolutely. Yeah. What do, I, I always forget. What does Foster's mean? It's a beer. Oh, okay. Beer. Just it's Australian for beer. Got you. Here. <laughs> not bia bia gotcha no yeah, yeah, i got yeah. it yeah why would you talk like that you're I don't know. I'm american I'm american yeah american It'd be ridiculous to yeah, talk like would any be. other way It'd be ridiculous it's the only beer available in australia i agree yeah that's yeah, that's a fact proven fact so all right well ian what do we got well like dave said in the intro i fucked up the outline <laughs> so we're <laughs> so i bit off more than i could chew so this is going to be a three-parter <laughs> that just means it's more in-depth uh in-depth analysis and research so good on you yep. ian 
Good on you, my friend. <laughs> so let's let's just jump right into it and get into the life of Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh was born April 23rd, 1968 in Lockport, New York, and he was the second child to Mildred and William McVeigh, having an older and younger sisters. Most accounts of McVeigh are that he was very shy and withdrawn. However, there are some people who described him as being very outgoing as a child, and he only withdrew in his teen years. A big thing with Timothy McVeigh is he claimed to be bullied in school. And by his accounts, in my opinion, don't warrant his outlook on life or really bullying, to be honest. It's more like kids just fucking with him every once in a while. Mm. Because McVeigh was tall and skinny, kids called him Noodle McVeigh. <laughs> Kids, kids are so clever with their names. Yeah. <laughs> they called Mike uh, Noodle Mike in college. Yeah. Wet, wet Noodle because he couldn't have any blue chew. Hey, uh oh. <laughs> You're ruining my college gimmick there, pal. <laughs> One time kids tried and failed to give him a swirly. Did you ever get a swirly, and, you guys? Oh. So how no. do you try and fail to give a swirly? Like, what does that mean? Like he got away? I, I, guess. I think so. Or the toilet yeah. didn't flush. I have never gotten a swirly nor has i've never seen a swirly happen it's like an urban legend to you i, I guess hmm. yeah, it is i've never witnessed it yeah I'm trying to remember if i've ever witnessed an actual swirly it's kind of a weird thing to do to someone it's gross man yeah Ugh. i mean a swirly is when you put someone's head in the toilet and right. flush it for all I mean, you what, uh, so- people who didn't grow up in the neighborhoods where they <laughs> Did swirlies on kids. Apparently none of us <laughs> grew up in those neighborhoods <laughs> would you rather get your ass kicked by the bullies or get a swirly uh, I guess an ass whooping. It's really so? kind of humiliating, I think. Yeah. I guess it would also depend on how many. Like, I wouldn't want 15 guys beating me down. I wouldn't want 15 guys beating me. Well, yeah. But, I mean, so, but one like, on one. Sure. One on one. Wanna, right. Like, yeah. A, like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Any hoodles. But, like, he would hold on to this idea that he was brutally bullied his whole life. And that's literally all that happened to him. I mean, there's, hor- like, horror stories of being bullied out here. And you would think that would be what happened to McVeigh, but it was really, it didn't amount to much. So you're saying as a postscript later on, after all this took place, he was using that as an excuse and you don't think it's, oh, you yeah. don't think it's warranted. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he would tell anybody who would listen how much he was bullied mm-hmm. and he almost lived in a fantasy world based around Star Wars. Like he, like he was the good guy, like Luke Skywalker that would save mm. the day. And this is something that he never grew out of up until the day he was put to death. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. What a jaded view of life to have. Sure. Mm, Damage this one was. <laughs> <laughs> Yoda Dave. <laughs> have we had? I think he's been on before, hasn't he? Oh, that's I that's hard so. to do. I don't know. <laughs> I will not be. <laughs> he just likes them. <laughs> the, the moaning. <laughs> Could have used him on the last bonus show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In later interviews, he would go as far as to compare the mirror building to the Death Star and the innocent people who died in the bombing to employees that worked on the Death Star for Darth Vader. It's a bit of a stretch. (laughs) A little bit. Yeah. When he would tell his bullying stories after the bombing, he would always make it a point that the U.S. government was the biggest bully of all. When McVeigh was 10 years old, his parents got divorced and he lived with his father for a time. This wasn't a clean divorce and his parents bounced back and forth, getting back together, and then splitting up again. And he found stability in his relationship with his grandfather, who was the one that introduced guns to McVeigh. So here's a turning point, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it, I like I have no problem with guns. Sure. But uh, we'll, we're going to see how Timothy takes this to a whole different level. While in high school, McVeigh became interested in computers and hacked into government computer systems on his Commodore 64 under the handle The Wanderer. In his senior year, he was named, quote, most promising computer programmer, but he never did anything with it and always had relatively bad grades. I had a Commodore 64. I never was able to hack into anywhere. I I don't even know what a Commodore 64 (laughs) is. Is that a computer? Yes, it's a computer, Mike. (laughs) Oh. A super old computer. <laughs> he hacked the government computer systems. God damn, he was good. That is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, from accounts of him in high school with the, at least with the computer stuff, I mean, he was, you know, had a promising future potentially. I mean, I remember my days on the Commodore 64 in the 80s, and it was, you know, you call into 
bulletin boards they called them and you know there were two lines and you could call in via a like a 14.4 baud modem and and then you beat off you beat off to 8 bit porn that's right oh 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 yeah i didn't know you could break into you know norad with that fucking computer goddamn yeah not surprising timothy mcveigh was not good with women and it was, it's reported that he only had two relationships in his whole life. The first was right after high school with a married woman that he met while he was working at Burger King. And the second one we'll get into later in the episode. She liked his Whopper, huh? Yeah, she was pretty. She was like 15 years older than him, too, at the time. He was oh, like 17. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's off to a good start. Again, potential, and then doesn't, doesn't live up to it, mm. the hype. Well, I think we're going to talk about it in a bit here. I think he probably turned off every woman in the world because he wouldn't shut the fuck up about the Turner Diaries and uh, <laughs> and what happened in Waco. <laughs> yeah, I can see that being a bit of a turnoff. That's not sexy talk? <laughs> yeah. How about those Turner Diaries, huh? Am I right? <laughs> Boom, legs open. <laughs> Start a race war, baby. Also, while working at Burger King, McVeigh started to really embrace the, the gun culture that his grandfather had brought him into. <laughs> He started religiously reading Soldier of Fortune magazine and decided he wanted to build a collection of guns. And side note, I was looking at all these like gun magazines that were listed. Soldier of Fortune was not a fun gun magazine. Like there were no like gun babes in it and all that, all the fun stuff. It was like super fucking serious military stuff. And he absolutely loved it. Yeah, like ads for mercenaries and stuff like that. Like, is this like yeah. not fucking around? <laughs> this stuff. is opposed to like the gun magazines when you say gun babes, like there's just like chicks in bikinis, like yeah, holding right, guns, or right? Like, like posing, yeah, yeah. guns and ammo. <laughs> yeah, like that was legit mercenary ads and, and whatnot. Yeah, this is some intense shit going on in uh, Soldier of Fortune. <laughs> Scary. Burger King wasn't making Mc, McVeigh the, the money he needed to buy the amount of guns that he wanted, so he quit and got a job as an armed security guard. At this time is when McVeigh got his hands on the Turner Diaries, and it flipped him from a guy that was really into a gu- into guns to a guy that was just absolutely obsessed with them. And he always made it a point in his interviews. Supposedly, it wasn't the racist stuff in the Turner Diaries that spoke to him. It was the Second Amendment and all the anti-government stuff. So take it for what you will. I mean, I get, I get that, I guess. I love Mein Kampf, you know, Hitler's book. I mean, it wasn't for the anti-Semitism. <laughs> it was because of Hitler's optimistic outlook on life, you know, so I get that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the same world in my mind. It's like, I, I think you could say McVeigh, it's like, he almost sounds like a guy that's like, would go around and saying that all black people are bad, but my buddy over here, the one, the only one that I know is good because he's into the same shit I'm into kind of thing. Yeah. Just kind of but picking then, and choosing what he wanted to uh, to believe and what was you know what he thought was good and and what he thought was a worthy cause. Yeah, I mean, it, I, 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 it's like the flip. They both they both go hand in hand. These anti government people and racism. I mean, it's one and the same. In all honesty, I think that's that's one hundred percent correct. I mean, there's certain assumptions you can make with groups, and I think that's probably one of them. Not everyone at a gun show is a white supremacist. But white supremacists feel comfortable at gun shows. Sure. Oh, I'm just thinking about the social media hits we're going to get on this. <laughs> Not uh, every NASCAR fan. Oh, sorry. We'll save that one for another time. <laughs> this NASCAR fan has no tattoos and all their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm drinking Miller Lite, high class. Not that bush light that they drink. True. Or PBR or whatever. You're the exception, NASCAR fan, my I, friend. I am the exception in a lot of ways. <laughs> I am. You can speak in full sentences. I love it. <laughs> After a couple years of working as an armed security guard and telling anyone who, who would listen to him about the Turner Diaries, McVeigh joined the Army. I feel like that's Ian in high school. Hey, you guys know about Roswell? Hear what happened to Roswell? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, fuck off, Ian. It was a weather balloon. Get the fuck out of here. Jesus, come on, man. That's already, Roswell, Roswell, that's Roswell. proven. <laughs> There might be a little truth to that. (laughs) (laughs) How did I know? McVeigh joined the army for a couple of reasons. One, it gave him unlimited access to guns. And two, he wanted to feel part of a group. He's also on record saying that if he lived in a big city, he would have easily joined a gang because he just wanted that structure of something like that. What gang is Noodle McVeigh going to (laughs) join? That's kind of what I was thinking. (laughs) I'm trying to think. Do you guys remember the movie The Warriors? I'm trying to think what gang. 
Yeah, Timothy McVeigh would be in. Uh, spoiler, I haven't seen it. But You've I never seen The Warriors? That's oh, surprising to you. Jesus. I know of it, but mm. I didn't take the time okay. to sit down and watch it. I know of lots of things, but... If it was made in the 80s, odds are I'm not going to watch it. 79, bro. Oh, okay. 79. Then maybe. Then maybe. There's a chance. <laughs> A lot of the movies that were made in the 80s that people love, we've been down that road. We sure. don't need to rehash all that. But 79, there's a chance. Okay. Yeah. I don't think this guy's uh, fit for gang life. <laughs> no. Yeah, not, what about like sure. a cult? Like, why would he have not joined some kind of cult? Like, if he's just looking uh, for that well, structure just, and that acceptance. Hmm. I think the guns are a big part, too. I mean, well, gangs, I, know, I know of some friends down in Texas times, that, that, that uh, had a cult and a wide range of <laughs> firearms that he might have yeah. fit in nicely with. That's that's very true. He didn't care clearly about women, so he didn't have to worry about, you know, someone fucking his wife. The valid observation. Just saying. Yeah. Just making connections through the the whole month here. <laughs> tying all the shows together. By most accounts, McVeigh was a model soldier. Uh, one general is even quoted as saying if he had an army of a bunch of McVeighs, he would never lose a battle. But even in the army, McVeigh was still an insufferable piece of shit and would not shut the fuck up about the Turner Diaries. And in this rambling, he found two people that were willing to listen to him, Terry Nichols and Michael Fortier. These three clicked immediately because Nichols and Fortier already had these views on life. Get into Terry Nichols for a minute. He was 10 years older than McVeigh, and he's he was one of those uh, sovereign citizen guys. Oh boy, those guys, yeah. The best. He, uh, yeah, he there's there's a good story about him not paying a twenty thousand dollar Chase credit card bill, and then uh, he went to court for it and countered Chase saying that they owed him all this silver and gold because the Federal Reserve isn't real and all this shit. <laughs> like, oh, he's just one of those insufferable dudes that just mm-hmm. he and he renounced himself as a U.S. citizen at one point okay, because bye. he didn't because he didn't want to pay his child support. Like just a pain in the ass person. Even though he was older, like McVeigh looked up to Nichols, um, but we'll see here in a bit that this flips and Nichols starts following anything that Timothy McVeigh says to do. So are and they then, mainly bonding over the anti-government stuff, not so much the racism stuff? It's Yeah, it's all the anti-government stuff. Yeah, okay. For these guys, the racism stuff, is it's it's secondary. It's still there, but it's, it's secondary. And then Michael Fortier, there isn't a ton to, to say about him other than he was a huge pothead and smoked a ton of meth and and had these same views. I think most potheads love meth, huh? It's kind of an outlier. Well, pot's a gateway drug, Dave, so it leads to meth. <laughs> that's just science, right? I don't think that's accurate, Mike. Well, you should take a dare class. <laughs> dare. <laughs> dare. Drugs are really excellent. <laughs> there you go. And kind of like McVeigh, Terry Nichols came from a broken home, and like all the sovereign citizen people, he blamed all of his shortcomings in life on the federal government. In 1989, Nichols left the army due to a hardship discharge and wouldn't get back in touch with McVeigh for another couple years. What's a hardship the, discharge? Something's going on at uh, home. You got to take care of your family or something. Yeah, so his family ran a farm. And so the farm was like getting like close to going out of business. Oh, okay. And, and, and that's how he ended up getting out. Okay. If you're so anti government, why are you in the military? Like literally fighting mm. for the government and the country that you're because you, like, so gu- you can shoot guns. Right. But like you would think if you felt so strongly about that, you would not, you know, you'd be in a militia. You join up your up own in the militia, woods right. somewhere. Sure. But so I don't, that's just weird. Why are all these guys, mm. like for McVeigh, Ian kind of explained it. He kind of fell into it because of his love for guns. But like if you're, Terry Nichols already well established in this belief of hating the government. And I don't know. It's just weird. It's an interesting thought. Well, I have a lot of those sometimes you do. And then I, a lot of times I don't. (laughs) Sometimes you don't also true. While the two of them were separated, McVeigh got really heavy into conspiracy theories, such as the world is really being ran by Jewish people behind the scene. And these ideas would only get stronger when he was sent to the Gulf War in 1991. The Gulf War started when Iraq invaded our ally, Kuwait, due to oil pricing and production disputes. U.S. soldiers were told to expect a brutal war that would be very deadly. In reality, we basically dominated the Iraqi army in only a few days, giving it the nickname the 100-hour war. America! Fucking A. (laughs) Woo! Come at us, brah. McVeigh would kill more people in the Oklahoma City bombing than we lost 
in the Gulf War. Yeah, wow. that sounds about right. I didn't know that till I read these notes, and that's just incredible, like crazy and sad. If Kuwait had maple syrup, uh, you know, under their territory, you think we would have been there? Uh, not <laughs> oil. If they had maple syrup, was their main export? I don't think so. Uh, probably no. not. No. No. Nope. Doubtful. Yeah. Nope. Also, I like my maple syrup from Canada, so I'll go invade Canada for maple syrup. <laughs> okay. McVeigh's part in the war was he was a gunner on a Bradley fighting vehicle. The name of the vehicle was Char- was Charlie 11, but McVeigh renamed it Bad Company after the song slash band Bad Company, and he played it on repeat over the vehicle's intercom system to make damn sure that everyone knew his vehicle was called Bad Company. <laughs> and like the Turner Diaries, he told everybody it was called Bad Company. Hey guys, you know what the name of this uh, Bradley fighting vehicle is? It's not Charlie 11. <laughs> it's Bad Company. And I can't deny. <laughs> this guy's so annoying. Could you imagine being a soldier that was like paired up to uh, to be in his troop or whatever for this? And he just won't quit playing this fucking song and you're in the middle of the desert trying I'd, to fight people? I'd probably just team up with the enemy at that yeah. point. Like, you a traitor and go to the other side. <laughs> Fuck this, dude. You're like, I, I'm Iraqi now. Yeah. <laughs> Anything. I'd rather work for Saddam. It's better than being with, uh, with Timothy McVeigh yeah. another minute. Yeah. Jesus Christ. This guy. <laughs> she plays that goddamn song one more time. It's bad company. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I like bad company and I like the bad company song. I don't want to hear that all day, every day, nonstop, especially from this jag off. (laughs) As far as kills go with McVeigh, the way he tells it and the U.S. Army tells it is that he only had two confirmed kills. McVeigh shot and killed two Iraqi soldiers that were a thousand yards away, and he got a medal for this. According to McVeigh, this is where he became really disillusioned with the U.S. government. He felt that it was too easy, and the Iraqi army had no chance. Like, it was basically a slaughter. Well, that's 100% accurate, sure. He also became came to believe that the U.S. was tricked into this war by the U.N., who was secretly ran by Jewish people. Oh, Thoughts on course. that one, Dave? Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, there he's wrong. There he's wrong. <laughs> Always this Jewish conspiracy stuff. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> yep. It was a it of, was a slaughter though. I mean that was <laughs> that's pretty accurate. Who gets a yeah. worse rap, Jewish people or reptilians, for how they run this world? Like they're both just shit on so much for for running the world. Uh, Constantly, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I was just trying to make a joke. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, was that offensive? No. Like you guys both just like went dead no. awkward silence. I, I, I was just making a joke. <laughs> You guys had me nervous. Like, did I say something bad? I, I just, I think historically, the people with the, the least power, you know, the the Jews, and the, somehow they're, you know, secretly running the world in this Jewish right. cabal. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. And the reptiles, who clearly are, well, oh, they're running the world enough. for sure. Well, we covered that, that, I believe. Two parts available in the archives. That's a hundred percent true. Have you ever seen They Live? Of course, it's true. Of course, I've seen They Live. <laughs> Roddy, Roddy, it's my favorite Come movies on. ever. Should have been an Academy Award winning mo- movie. On the flip side of McVeigh's version of it and the U.S. Army's version of it, according to three of his fellow soldiers, McVeigh shot and killed four Iraqi prisoners that had already surrendered, just basically walked up execution style and killed all four of them. When McVeigh's commander has been asked about this, he has always refused to talk about it in fear of being tried for war crimes. So you can kind of, I think, lean towards there could be some truth to this. Yeah, because if, if he didn't do it, why not just say that? Well, and the guy who later on has no problem blowing up kids as collateral damage, I don't think it's a stretch to think he may have executed uh, some prisoners of war, right? He, right. Fair point. Before the Gulf War started, McVeigh was scheduled to go into training to become a Green Beret, but it got pushed back. When the war was over, instead of taking some time off, he went right into training, and because he was absolutely exhausted, he failed. Of course, this wasn't the fault of him for not taking time off, which they offered him. This was the Jewish-ran UN that caused the Gulf War to happen and ruined his chances at becoming a Green Beret. Oh, naturally. They probably started the whole war just to prevent McVeigh from mm-hmm. becoming a Green Beret. Right. He hooked up with Terry Nichols, and that was mistake number Absolutely. one. Absolutely. He was targeted from day one. Yep. When McVeigh was officially out of the Army... He went through depression over these issues, and looking for something else to belong to, he signed up for a trial membership with the KKK 
after being impressed by a pamphlet of theirs he was given at a gun show. <laughs> I, <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> What do you get with a trial membership yeah. for the KKK? Like, first 30 days free. <laughs> Sign up now. If you don't find the love of your life. <laughs> I know they give you a t-shirt. because he tra- I was reading like in depth about his gun show experiences at one point. He traded his, his membership KKK shirt for something oh at a gun God. show. <laughs> free trial. You get 30 days of hate and one free cross burning. <laughs> like, for real. Like, what does that even mean? I think it's like a, it's kind of like a gang thing. All these fucking groups do this. It's like this initiation thing to prove you're tough enough and committed enough to this bullshit cause to be be a member of it, kind of thing. Mm. They all do this trial membership shit, from what I read. Like you have to go in and hang out with them for a month, and you're not KKK material. Yeah, (laughs) they tell you like black ball. (laughs) Well, white ball. You guys know where white supremacists do their shopping? Where? KKK Mart. <laughs> <laughs> so after his trial run with the KKK, uh, McVeigh didn't officially join because he said the KKK was, quote, manipulative to young people and they were too devoted to the racist stuff and not the anti government Second Amendment stuff that McVeigh was interested in. Oh, I mean. So he canceled his membership before they charged his credit card after those 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> Motherfucker got out quick. So he wasn't familiar enough with the KKK to know that they were focused more on this racist stuff instead KKK. of... Oh, so you're like, you're anti-government, pro-Second Amendment? Yeah. I'm listening. <laughs> I'll give you 30 days. Ridiculous. Ugh. At Army Functions, McVeigh wasn't making any friends either. He was known as, quote, a vaguely racist oddball who kept guns just laying all over his house. And since he wasn't finding people in the army who shared his worldviews, he started attending gun shows more and more to find like-minded people. I mean, I wouldn't expect to find those kind of people at gun shows, right? Like vaguely racist (laughs) people at gun shows? Maybe at the art museum or the orchestra, but definitely not at gun shows. (laughs) Hear me out on this. A new, new cartoon, vaguely, what is it? Vaguely racist oddball. (laughs) <laughs> That's got serious potential. Like, we could write that for sure. A cartoon? Yeah. <laughs> that lends itself to cartoon work. Vaguely racist oddball. Let's do it. It's a do fucking it. winner, guys. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. It's a great name. What is the uh, the Chappelle bit? The blind racist? Clayton Bigsby. Yeah. Blind. Was it? Blind white supremacist? Is that what it is? Yeah. Fucking hilarious, man. <laughs> yeah. Probably the greatest outrageous. Chappelle bit ever. I was... Really like dumb. white power, white power. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the funniest things I've ever seen it's in my really entire good. life. It's really damn funny. <laughs> I love the end of it, dude, where they're all chanting like to see his face. Like, y'all want to see my face? And then that dude's head, <laughs> the dude's head blows up. <laughs> that was on. Was that the first Chappelle show? I think. If you've never seen that, it, it, one of the greatest things I've ever it seen. It's really funny. Clayton Bigsby, white supremacist. Yeah, and dude, that he, was it. I think that was the first episode. I think I it think was. That, that pushed some boundaries, man. Oh. And he, uh, like the, the the postscript to that story wasn't the end of it. He divorced his wife because he couldn't, he couldn't stand being with a woman who would marry a black guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my God. Dave Chappelle's fucking genius, man. <laughs> So in late 1991, McVeigh officially left the army and moved back to New York, settling down in Pendleton and got a job working overnights as a security guard for the Buffalo Zoo. At this time, the depression wasn't going away and McVeigh was suffering from PTSD. He made an honest effort to get treatment through the VA, but he was too ashamed to use his real name and they would not allow him to get help anonymously. I I don't know if this would have changed the results of what we talked about in part one, but this is the one and only moment in this story that I actually feel bad for Timothy McVeigh because I know stuff like this is a huge issue with veterans. Sure, still to this day. I mean, there's a huge, I, I guess, stigma attached to PTSD where a lot of people don't seek probably the treatment they need because they're embarrassed about it. But fuck, I mean, can you imagine seeing some of that stuff that, that these guys have seen? I don't understand the not letting them get help anonymously thing. I don't know if that's changed, but at least back then, I, I don't get that. Why, why they wouldn't let him get it anonymously i mean does it have to do with 
you know, like going to a VA hospital, not wanting to, I don't know, sign in under your real name kind of thing. Yeah, his reasoning was that he didn't want there to be records to jeopardize him getting employment or something in okay, the future. Yeah. Be like, yeah, I get that. Like and have it labeled that he had some type of you know issues with mental PTSD. illness. Sure, sure. I think it's a valid concern. I mean, and the suicide rate of veterans is still like very high. It's it's terrible. Not good. Yeah, there was a documentary I watched not too long ago on that, and the number it's like it's a really staggering number. How many of those guys uh, commit suicide a day? Yeah, it's awful. I think there's been historically a lot of issues with the level of care provided by the VA for veterans and. Uh, yeah, it's awful. While working at the Buffalo Zoo, McVeigh still wouldn't shut the fuck up about the Turner Diaries and would talk to his coworkers about it constantly. Can you imagine being on the overnight shift, just you and him, <laughs> and like you're just trying to like fucking sit there and like watch like late night Three Stooges or something, and he's just talking your ear off? Yeah. Was he a security guard I'd at the fucking zoo? Fucking throw him in the tiger pit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, what about a race war? Let's start a race war. Turn our diaries, race war. Just get this guy out of here, man. Oops. Hey, how about Oops. Roswell? Did you see the aliens landed at Roswell? <laughs> Shut up, Ian. It's a fucking weather balloon. Everyone's ever worked with Ian in their life, <laughs> including us. We let him do that show in the first month just to get it out of his system. It's a cover, government cover up. The aliens, they have a Roswell. Area 51. I feel like if I was a security <laughs> guard working with McVeigh, he would have had an accident in the uh, tiger pit. <laughs> God damn, that's a bold call. I'd be like, oh, Timothy, did you see there's a federal agent in the uh, tiger pit? Let's go check it out. When he goes to look, boom, throw him out Royal Rumble style. Jesus. Flip him over the fucking barricade. <laughs> Oops. Well, his shit with the Buffalo Zoo talking to coworkers the way he was about the Turner Diaries and stuff and getting more and more worked up about the federal government, it caused one of the guys that he worked with to bring a tape recorder with him and record McVeigh talking in case he made a specific threat against somebody. Wow. Yeah. Attending gun shows was getting McVeigh more into the conspiracy world, like into the crazier shit, like FEMA death camps and all that real out of control shit. Oh, at gun shows? That that seems out of character. It's not where I would expect that kind of talk. (laughs) Oh, gosh. So many answers I'm going to have to give. (laughs) (laughs) And as he was getting more and more into this, Ruby Ridge happened. Oh, boy. Not just to McVeigh, but to many people in this this world, Ruby Ridge was viewed as the first shot in this inevitable civil war that was going to come with the U.S. government. Just after Ruby Ridge happened, Terry Nichols rolled back into McVeigh's life, showing up in New York with his new mail-order bride from the Philippines. Is that still a thing, mail order brides? Can you still do that? I'll sign uh, up right now. You got something for me? Let's do it. <laughs> Let's see what happens. What country would you pick to get a mail order bride from? Ooh, I don't know. What well, can I like? Can I like browse the menu? I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I feel like it's always shady countries like the Philippines and the uh, yeah in Russia. Can yeah, like can right? I pick any you country? Find a gorgeous Filipino woman, or you know, smoking. Uh, I'm not saying that yeah. Russian, Ukrainian I, I just, women. I would just have not to. Bad. Look, I'd have to look through and see. Hmm. Yeah. Curious how that works. I'll do it for a bonus show. Will you? Yeah. Hmm. We'll see what happens. What are we going to do when she gets here? Just <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Thirty day money back return, right? <laughs> Not how it works. She can stay at your house for thirty days. Well, I didn't say that. Oh, well. just meant I can send her back, you know, or him back, whoever I choose. You never okay. know, sir. All right, we're going to look at coming that. soon to Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> Mail order bride episode. Polygamy Mike, <laughs> mail order bride. After Nichols was done visiting New York, McVeigh got heavy into gambling, specifically betting lots of money on the Buffalo Bills. For people that are unfamiliar with football, the Buffalo Bills went to the Super Bowl for four consecutive years and lost every time. Wow, that was, was a bad Any streak. Any listeners we have in Buffalo, you just kicked straight up in the dick with that <laughs> comment. God damn. Who was the field goal kicker? Scott Norwood. Is that yep. what it was? Yeah. <laughs> terrible. That's I was I was young at that time, but even I remember that. Like they four straight years. Yeah. That's like the yeah. only thing that us Clevelanders could look back on and be like, well, at least that yeah. wasn't us. And you're like <laughs> 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 The Browns have never even been to a Super Bowl, so they were good in the fifties and sixties though. In, in the eighties. It still never made it to the Super Bowl. They were good before the Super Bowl started. They were. They were. It's true. 
in February 1993, right after McVay lost a ton of money on Super Bowl 27, he decided that was time to, to get out of New York. So he t- headed down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. All right, so here's a trivia question. What Necronomapod alum did the, toin, the, the, toin, the coin toss in Super Bowl 27? I know it. I know it. Who is it? O.J. Simpson. That's right. Yep. Boom. Put that on trivia. God damn, I beat <laughs> motherfuckers. <laughs> I like how I raised my hand. Too. He, I don't know. he raised his hand, Ian. I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> Even though Ian said he knew it before me. <laughs> you you get to go, but you get to go first because you raised your hand. Well, too. I follow rules. <laughs> God damn it. Etiquette. Who was the halftime show? Oh, I don't know that. Do oh, you know? I do know. 1993. Would that have been Michael Jackson? Yeah, it, it absolutely was wow. Michael Jackson. He didn't raise his hand. Nice. <laughs> my hands up. Sorry, Ian. Mike. Michael Jackson. That's absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> I was going to guess Salt and Pepper. So. Oh, I like Salt and Pepper. <laughs> that was a big Super Bowl then. OJ yeah, Simpson. Sure, and man. Then, uh, fucking Michael Jackson. So much crime in that future. That was the year Buffalo it, got fucking smoked by Aikman, I think. Like yeah, 50 they, something to 20 something. <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah. Was it two years in a row that they lost to Dallas? Or was it. Because it wasn't always Dallas. Was no, it wasn't always Dallas. Uh, there was somebody out there that was the year that the fuck Aikman out. smoked them, though. All right, Ian, you keep going. I'm going to look this up because I don't want people coming at us for not saying the right thing. <laughs> well, while he was down in Florida, he was attending gun shows, and there he met a guy named Roger Moore. James Bond, Roger Moore? You know what? I've never seen a full James Bond movie. Thank you. Thank you. you guys. I always get shit on for that. <laughs> you guys are I have never seen a James Bond. Oh, you guys... <laughs> Dave quits the show. <laughs> He's walking out. He's going to get out of here. I am apoplectic at the moment. Uh, it's just why. Why? The best thing Pierce Brosnan ever did is Mrs. Doubtfire. So no need for watching it. Probably of those. the worst movie I've ever seen. <laughs> Stop that. It's awful. Robin awesome. Williams is awful. His that movies are awful. Terrible. He was awful. It's terrible. <laughs> what about Flubber? Oh, well, okay. That one's pretty bad. That one's pretty bad. I can't stand Robin Williams. Movies. Oh my gosh. That's terrible. I can't believe you've never seen a James Bond movie. I have no time for that. (laughs) I've seen everyone five times at least. (laughs) So this Roger Moore guy, it's a, it's a name to remember. He's going to come up in part three and there's a lot of names throughout this. And we're going to hit on all these guys and, uh, and make sure we circle back to him. But so he met this guy named Roger Moore. And while those two were hanging out, the ATF did their first raid on Mount, on Mount Carmel in Waco and the standoff with FBI started uh, real quick, the uh, Buffalo Bills lost to the Giants, the Redskins, and then twice to Dallas. 90 was the Giants, 91 was the Redskins, um, 92 and 93 Dallas. So was that Aikman back-to-back Super Bowl wins? 90, so the 92 season for 93. One of those, Bernie Kosar, was the backup for the Super Bowl win because that's when Bernie got his Super Bowl ring. Well, that probably would have been the last one then, Super Bowl 28. Well, it should have been 94. So it was 91 through 94 was mm-hmm. when they were there. So while he's hanging out with his new friend, Roger Moore, the ATF did their first raid on Mount Carmel in Waco and the standoff with the FBI started. After b- obsessing about what was going on at Waco and watching the news, McVeigh decided he was going to drive to Texas to join the protests. When McVeigh got there, he set up a little shop on his Geo Metro on the roof or on the hood of his Geo Metro, handing out anti-government pamphlets and selling bumper stickers. Was it like leftover clan swag from his 30 day <laughs> free trial? <laughs> yeah. No, because they were not as anti-government as he wanted, Dave. Pay attention like to the Cross story. Burning Festival 87. Woo! <laughs> Do you think can you still get one of those like bumper stickers he was selling? Do probably Good question. Those somewhere. Probably. Wouldn't that be something? But it just so happens at the Waco protests, Lewis Beam was there at the same time that McVeigh was. If we remember from part one, Lewis Beam was the KKK guy that came up with leaderless resistance, which was that true like terrorism, lone wolf style stuff. No hierarchy, and, so there's no one to take down. Right. And from recorded conversations, he knew damn well that the Oklahoma City bombing was going to happen. We don't know for 100% that they spoke, but we know that they were there at the same time. And I think... Based on what we went over in part one, these two talked. Yeah. After spending a few days at Waco, McVeigh got back on the road, traveling from gun show to gun show, selling the Turner Diaries and all the shit that he was selling at the Waco protests. (laughs) 
So he get just had a whole clan swag here. <laughs> get your Turner yeah. Diaries Volume One here. All while blasting Bad Company from his car. It's Bad Company. Reliving his days. Oh boy. Along his travels, McVeigh would eventually end up in Kingman, Arizona, where he met up with his old army friend Michael Fortier. Fortier's place would become somewhat of like just a place that McVeigh could crash whenever he wanted over the next couple of years. Fortier was still up to drugs like he was back in his army days and introduced McVeigh to meth to help him stay awake when he was driving across country to all these gun shows. Well, there you go. I, it helps, I'm sure. <laughs> I guarantee it helps. Yeah. <laughs> and we said San Diego to fucking Maine, am I right? <laughs> Two days, brother. <laughs> Fortier was the, the guy that he met back when he met uh, Terry Nichols, too, at the same time, right? It was the two of them. Right. Yeah, so this was one of his two old uh, army chums. We'll be right back. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Something keeping you from achieving your 2020 goals? Let's face it. These are certainly trying times. From being cooped up inside your home to wondering how you're going to pay next month's bills, we're all experiencing some form of stress or strain on our mental health. And for that... BetterHelp is here for us. BetterHelp is an online mental health provider that will assess your needs and match you up with your own licensed professional therapist. The best part? No waiting rooms. That's a pretty big deal if you're as impatient as I am. BetterHelp is a safe and private online environment that will have you communicating with a counselor within the first 24 hours. And once you've begun, you can send your counselor a message at any time, always getting a helpful response in a timely manner. You even have the ability to schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all from the comfort of your very own couch. BetterHelp is available worldwide and has a broad range of expertise available, including licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflict, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. Some of these services may not otherwise be available locally in your area. Not happy with your counselor? No worries. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches and makes it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Remember, everything you share with your BetterHelp counselor is completely confidential. And while it's not a crisis line, it is a convenient, professional, and affordable way to seek the help that you deserve. Financial aid is even offered for those who qualify. Want to hear how BetterHelp assisted people just like you? Check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. Look, we here at Necronomapod want you to start living a happier life. So, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting BetterHelp.com slash Necro. Join over 800,000 people already taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp.com slash Necro. In April of 1993, McVeigh traveled to Tulsa where he attended the Wanamaker's yearly, quote, world's largest gun show that still goes on to this day. I'm going this year. I think we're doing, oh, a, yeah? we're doing yeah. a live show from there. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're they're going to love me. <laughs> <laughs> Again, McVeigh went around talking about all of his conspiracies, that the world was being ran by a Jewish UN, and one of the people he specifically met and hung out with a lot at the show was a guy named Andrea Straussmeier, who is known as Andy the German. <laughs> sounds like a, a character on the Stern show. Andy the German. Yeah, it just sounds like someone they would it have. It is the Jews, Timothy. The Jews do everything. <laughs> Andy the German. Yeah, a lot of characters going tonight. Yeah. I have to make, start making a yeah. list. Don't keep a list on the wall over here. Yeah, and all these idiots are going to come back up in part three. Idiots. Ian's words. Yeah. Nobody come at Not me. mine. No, don't come at us. Andy the German was said to be the grandson of one of the earliest members of the Nazi party, stemming from... Him having a registration card with a lower number than Hitler. Oh, well, something to be proud of, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I think all these guys, like, in, you know, we're going to get to where Andy the German ends up. I think all these guys just fucking loved him because he's like the only real German person they knew. They probably bought whatever line of bullshit he was saying. Uh, yeah, I'm that sure. Makes- Andy was a former German soldier who came to the U.S. to participate in Civil War reenactments. <laughs> Okay. What the fuck? That's so weird. All right. So he, he, he was... wanted to uh, to cosplay some Civil War, some LARPing, yeah. if you will. Was he a Confederate soldier in the uh, in the role play? <laughs> no, he was a fucking Nazi infiltrator. He made up his own character. I will kill both sides. <laughs> 
it said that way, he was. A, go up to our civil or war reenactor and call them LARPers and watch how mad they get. <laughs> Spoiler alert: they don't like it. They don't like it. No, I think it's pretty cool. I don't know. A good friend of mine does civil war reenactment. I don't think it's bad either, but I think it's funnier to call them LARPers and then they get all fired up. Well. I'm going to introduce you to him next time. That Say, hey, you, you, oh, you're, and Dave you said, can call Dave the LARPer said, and we'll Dave see what happens. Oh, Dave said, you, Dave said you're the LARPer. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> <K>, bye. <laughs> the stories about Andy the German were that he was very hard to get along with. Uh, that he would like stay up real late at night painting like Civil War action figures or like little miniature figures, and when mm. he fucked up, he would get real mad and start screaming in German and nine nine <laughs> nine nine nine. <laughs> so I'm saying angry German, you don't say <laughs> that never happens. So these Civil War guys were kicking him out left and right, and he bounced around staying at these guys' houses in hopes of getting employment with the U.S. DEA since he had been part of Germany's special forces. Oh, of course. Why not? Naturally. After that fell through and running out of places to stay, he somehow made friends with Robert Millar and moved to Elohim City. And Robert Millar, who we talked about, what, last episode? Yes. What was his deal again? He founded Elohim City back in the 70s, and Elohim City is right on the it's in oklahoma right on the border of arkansas and it became the kind of a landing spot for all of these groups to just if you're a white racist in a christian identity movement you're welcome at elohim city mm. i don't think i'd be welcome at elohim no. city they would not like well me initially there. you would be and then you'd talk till i open my mouth yeah. 30 seconds if you later. kept your mouth shut they'd love you <laughs> you could run from air <laughs> Andy the German absolutely loved it in Elohim City. Oh, shocker. Weird. <laughs> Fit right in. <laughs> like a duck to water. And he made himself in charge of paramilitary training, training people at Elohim City for combat. Made himself in charge. <laughs> yeah, like, he just kind of designated that. Now. I'm doing this. Now, back in at the Wanamaker gun show, after bonding over Waco, Andy the German gave McVeigh a card with information on how to get to Elohim City. We don't know for sure if it was friendly or if Andy was trying to recruit McVeigh, but I think it's fair to say it was a little bit of both. Also at Wanamaker, McVeigh hooked up with Roger Moore that he had met back at the gun shows in Florida. After sharing a table for the weekend, Moore invited McVeigh back to his farm in Arkansas. After staying with Moore for 10 days, McVeigh headed to Michigan to go hang out with Terry Nichols. This guy's everywhere. He's yeah, traversing he's, he's the country. Really seeing everybody here. Yeah. Yep. This is again, if we're making a web of like the people he knows, we're doing fucking Charlie from Always Sunny on the wall. Like that meme we always post. I think we mentioned it in another show where it's just like a huge spider web of uh connections of people. Yeah. That's what we got yeah. going on right now. Yeah, and it's crazy. We're we'll see in part three how when I mentioned uh Roger Moore from back in Florida. Starting with Roger Moore, every name we bring up tonight is going to come back up in part three as playing out in some role in the actual bombing. Mm. Now, this is where McVeigh and Nichols would become really, really close. So close that Nichols' mar mail order bride, Mara Faye, would become extremely jealous of them. But even though she was very jealous, Mara Faye would eventually have a brief affair with Timothy McVeigh. Uh oh. So that's his, that's his second hookup. Uh oh. <laughs> This guy's got such game. He's uh, it's only the second girl he's gotten, huh? I can't see what would be charming about Timothy McVeigh. <laughs> the Turner Diaries. What about the Turner Diaries, honey? <laughs> I want to start a race war. The longer McVeigh and Nichols spent time together, it quickly became evident that McVeigh could get Nichols to do whatever he wanted, basically cucking him completely. A couple weeks after McVeigh showed up at the Nichols farm, the final assault at Waco had taken place. And we know from a couple weeks ago how that ended. McVeigh watched all the news coverage. While according to Nichols, he was crying out of anger. The mm. final straw for McVeigh was when the ATF took down the Branch Davidians flag and raised their own. McVeigh saw this as the U.S. law enforcement declaring that they had won a war on U.S. citizens and something had to be done about it. I think the flag thing was completely unnecessary. Honestly. It was a it's huge just, slap in the face. It's just not. It's, just, yeah, it's, it's not your. That's not your place. You yeah. know. It's just not necessary. I agree. You're a. It a, is kind of like war at that. It's like, what are you saying right now by doing that? The optics on that are, are terrible, and it just had no place. 
two episodes of Waco available in our archives as of last week, <laughs> two weeks ago. And that's the thing with all of these people at all these groups and anybody they were trying to recruit at gun shows and stuff. It's all the optics. All you had to show these guys was the ATF raising that flag in the building burning and you can whip everybody up, you know? Sure. And, it's and we, all optics. Yeah, it's it's a hundred percent all optics. We're not talking about deep thinkers here or you know, it's a it's a black and white thing and then you know, things like that that count. Yeah. Well, McVeigh headed out from the Nichols farm and went back on his gun show trips. But the stuff he was selling was ramping up in violent rhetoric. He was selling shirts that had the Waco fire on it that said, quote, Federal Bureau of Incineration. ATF hats that had bullet holes riddled through the logo, a Waco propaganda video, and going as far as to hand out business cards that had the name and address of the sniper who killed Vicki Weaver at Ruby Ridge. That's bold. Yeah, gosh. Yeah, that I mean, like if if like just say you're at the gun show just to buy some guns, you're not really into all this bullshit. Mm -hmm. And he hands you that card, be like, "Whoa, yeah. <laughs> just hand no, thank you. Like, I'm gonna leave this right, on pal. the table." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But again, if that's your thing, and you think that that sniper, well, that's a you know, murdered Ricky Weaver, then right. you, you know that makes sense. I feel like there's there's a law being broken there to some degree since that guy's a, a federal agent but uh or works for the fbi whatever however that works but hmm. it's a bold move i don't know the propaganda video he sold was called waco the biggest lie and this video put all the blame on the federal government and promoted ideas about the final day of waco that simply weren't true like what uh yeah i mean yeah we can go into this i think this would be a good thing from yeah. some of the feed some of the feedback that we got on the the tibbs interview uh, the bullets being fired into the building, those flashes, uh, I th that's been disproven. And in the interview I did with Tibbs, he fully believes that aspect of it. Um, yeah. And, and you, I think, Ian, you took some shit, I mean, from a couple of people as far as uh, that being a softball interview because you didn't push back on, uh, on Tibbs' my thoughts intention, on that. Yeah. I mean, my intention was just to get his side of the story. That's what he believes. You know, I mean, I said it in part two that it it's not accurate, and I'm saying it again that it's, it's not accurate. But that's what he believes. I mean, I I wasn't going to get into an argument with the guy about it. Yeah, I mean, it was a I conversation thought, with the guy. It wasn't a hard hitting. You know, it wasn't frank. It wasn't supposed to be a hard hitting interview. You know, questioning and 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 hitting back and and trying to refute what he had to say. So I, yeah. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that's valid that criticism. Way. It wasn't promoted yeah. that way, but. Waco has probably been our most polarizing topic we've ever covered. I mean, we've heard since we started this whole month with Ruby Ridge, um, you know, we've had criticism from both sides saying, you know, we were, you know, we had people saying we weren't hard enough on Vicky Weaver, which mm -hmm. is okay. Find us some actual facts because there's not. Um, we've had people saying we were, you know, siding or like Ian was siding with Tibbs and all his shit. Then we had all kinds of gun people coming at us saying that we were too strict on them or you know we didn't know what the fuck we were talking about and so all that so you know when you're pissing people off on both sides then you did something right i i would agree i thought it was a great conversation with tibbs and i don't, I don't know that and it, it wasn't our place it wasn't that kind of interview it was just a conversation to hear his thoughts and you know i, thought it was I just wanted to hear his side of the story yeah and it was fucking entertaining as yeah, shit it was great we're here for you know to entertain people this ain't the bbc man <laughs> you know <laughs> It we're is what it drinking is. Some beers. Yeah, we're drinking <laughs> some beers and talking to Tibbs. You don't have to push back on everything the guy says. It's his opinion. It's okay. Relax, guys. So, like I said, I mean, the, the the Waco, the biggest lie documentary. It was just, it was really, it's just a propaganda film pushing everything on the U.S. government. Like the Branch Davidians did nothing wrong at all. Not the Branch Davidians. David Koresh, I think. I mean, he was really the one at fault in a lot of things. And he was, I think, if you're looking at the branch yeah. video side of thing. I mean, those yeah. people, we've, you don't need to go down that road. We fucking covered that. Listen to Waco. <laughs> Give us some downloads, so, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some downloads, motherfuckers. There's the new shirt. We Born right here. This video became McVeigh's new Turner Diaries. He would talk about this shit nonstop and playing it for people any chance he got, including jobs as a security guard he kept a tv and a vcr in his car and would bring it into the job and show co-workers this video oh my god hey guys what about the biggest lie wake <laughs> up what about that 
Remember when you had to like carry all that around to show people a video? Now you're just like, hey, I'm going to send you this link. Yeah, Pull up right, your phone right. and watch this. Let me hook up this uh, VCR for you and you can take a look at it. <laughs> oh, Waco, you say? <laughs> Give me 20 minutes. I'm going to run to my car, come back and set this up. <laughs> the biggest lie, really. The biggest lie. Meanwhile, he's supposed to be doing security. So, you know, those poor animals. Getting towards the end of 93, McVeigh had written his sister Jennifer a letter alluding to him robbing banks. And in December of 1993, he gave her three $100 bills that he said came from a bank robbery he helped plan. That's smart. Now, if McVeigh was involved in any bank robberies, it would have been with a group called the Aryan Republican Army. Like we talked about in part one, this idea of robbing banks had been a big part of funding these groups with their buying guns and, and stuff since the early 80s. The ARA was inspired by the 80s bank robbery group we talked about last week called The Order. One of the key members of this group called himself Commander Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Commander Pedro's real name was Pete Langan, who outside of the white supremacy world was on his path to becoming a transgendered woman. And when he dressed in women's clothing, he went by the name Donna McClure. And it's safe to say that the world of people that we've been talking about knew full well about the cross-dressing, but and we'll see about that in part three, but they weren't aware of the fact that he wanted to fully transition into a woman. I, it, it seems oddly accepting in a world of people. Hate. That, that, yeah. They generally don't seem very accepting of, of other tolerance. people. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. The, it's We'll see in part three with some eyewitness stuff that there's enough evidence to show that they were at least cool with him dressing as a woman. God damn. There's a teaser. Huh. That's interesting. Another member of the ARA was a guy named Richard Guthrie. Guthrie had been kicked out of the Navy for drawing a swastika on the side of the ship and then made his way through the white supremacy world after. Oh, you can't do that in the Navy? Draw swastikas <laughs> yeah. on your ships? <laughs> yeah. Apparently but, it's frowned you know upon. What? I don't understand yeah. these fucking people with the Nazi stuff and the swastika. Like, so many guys gave their lives to fight against the Nazis. Why the fuck do we have to... I don't understand the logic but by flying the Nazi flag. In this day and age, I don't I, get I, it at all. I, I could never explain that. I don't either. That was my rant for the episode. <laughs> it's so fucking I, I, I have to quit two sentences in and out. <laughs> I, Me in college. I, fucking Nazis. It's, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I don't get it. I don't know what's going on with that. Nope. Between these two guys and some other unknown members, they carried out 22 bank robberies within two years, totaling $225,000. That's not very much. No, I it's get like yeah, 10k, you, 10k a job. Is that even worth it? God damn, that is a small yeah. amount for 22 bank robberies. There's no concrete evidence that McVeigh was part of this group, but there is proof that the ARA and McVeigh traveled the same gun show circuit and were all in Arizona together in 1995. If McVeigh was robbing banks, it would have been with these guys. And in part three, we're gonna see, like I said before, with you know Pete Lang and dressing up like a woman there's a lot of evidence that at minimum mcveigh knew pete langan so i mean there's circumstantial evidence that he may have been involved in these bank robberies right yeah i i would i would lean towards he was probably i would say i mean there's no concrete mm -hmm. proof but there's i mean there's a lot of smoke there yeah and when you get into groups like these everybody knows everybody so it's not like it's a small, there's it's a zero community. chance he was unaware of these things happening, right? Okay, right. Yeah, I it's mean, this isn't a large say. world. Yeah, I mean, like, this isn't a large world of people that we're talking yeah, about exactly. in all reality, so. Can we stop calling him Pete Lance? Go back to Commodore Pedro, please. <laughs> Commodore Pedro is a cool fucking name. <laughs> Com or com Commander. Oh, I was just saying. Com Commander. Like Commodore Pedro. Commodore Pedro. After his bank robbing claims, McVeigh headed back to Arizona to hang out with Michael Fourier, and the two of them decided to rob a local National Guard armory. They only got away with an ice pick and a shovel before <laughs> guards were alerted. An ice pick and a shovel yeah. from an armory. <laughs> Not a bar. They didn't rob a bar and get an ice pick and a shovel. Yeah. At this time, the two of them also started playing around with explosives. They started making pipe bombs that were average at best. And this is one of the big points towards Mc, McVeigh not being a lone wolf. And one of the points that I ag agree with personally is how did he go from making faulty pipe bombs to in a year and a half after making a two fuse 7,000 pound truck bomb 
that could cause the mirror building to collapse? That's a great question. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What's the a stretch, right? Without any outside <laughs> yeah, I, involvement? Sure. As 1994 went forward, McVeigh started cutting ties with people that he felt weren't dedicated enough to the cause, even canceling his NRA membership, saying they were a, quote, weak warrior. Also at this time, McVeigh decided that he and Nichols were going to go into business at gun shows selling small amounts of ammonium nitrate. This was not successful, but it was their first step towards building a bomb, whether they had help or not. Mm. That was fairly common, right? Like people selling this kind of ammonium nitrate bomb making material at gun shows. Yeah, you just sell small amounts of it. Yeah. And like, oh, it's just fertilizer. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you dare tell us we can't. Yeah. It's America. We'll do whatever we want. <laughs> I'm not wearing my mask. Fuck you. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it was also September 1994 that brought the official last straw for Timothy McVeigh when President Clinton signed the Public Safety and Recreational Firearms Use Protection Act into law. What's which that, was Ian? The assault rifle ban. Mm. It was a it was a 10-year assault rifle ban. It expired and has not been re-signed. And he viewed this as the Turner Diaries was coming true, that the U.S. government was taking guns away from mm. citizens and it was time to go. Hey, Ian, I signed that bill and my name's Bill. It's quite a coincidence, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> you know another coincidence cigars fit in vaginas it's amazing <laughs> very coincidental thank you mr president <laughs> we appreciate it i was nervous having secret service standing here all episode I'd like to shove a good cohiba up a woman's pussy it's great <laughs> mr president you would have loved uh, the bonus episode we just did what kind of bonus episodes that Mike? Aliens and tentacles and sex with humans. Give me a boner already. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> Hillary, she don't give me a boner, but aliens, they give me a big boner. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, that's uh Where else are you gonna get a president dropping in on your podcast? <laughs> it it happens yeah. sometimes. Well, you know. That is an exclusive. Finally, the Secret Service can fucking leave the studio because they've been making me nervous the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> Jackass, jackasses, get out of here. And with that, we will pick up on part three because as soon as that bill was signed in, that's when the bomb making really started. Mm -hmm. You got pissed and off. And we'll get into the construction of the bomb, how all these jackasses fit into that final day. And we'll also, we're going to introduce two other people to this story next week. <laughs> more people. That's yeah, the two story more people. Needs. That shows the ATF had a real chance to raid Elohim City and potentially stop this from happening, but they didn't because they hadn't been retrained from Waco yet. Really? That's an interesting fact. Yep. I don't hmm. disagree on the retraining. I feel like you probably shouldn't pass up situations where you feel like you need to intervene. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> well, if they're probably gun shy after getting, you know. Well, they weren't after gun fucking they, things up so They poorly. weren't gun shy after Ruby Ridge. Well, yeah. But yeah, next week we're going to, that's, after we get into the bomb making, we're going to get into how they went, how the ATF went so hard on Ruby Ridge and Waco and the amount of evidence that they had to roll into Elohim City and they decided not to because they already fucked up so bad with Ruby Ridge and Waco. Hey, Ian, you know what my favorite song is? <laughs> What's that, Mr. It's President? Devil with the blue dress, blue dress on. Devil with the blue dress on. <laughs> this guy just won't leave at this point. He just, he's just here. He wants to hang out with us. <laughs> Mr. President, can I, I offer you a Foster's? I love Foster's. <laughs> it's Australian for beer. <laughs> I, I feel like that's what Bill Clinton would be like in real life if you were partying with him. Like, he would be that dude at the end that just doesn't want to leave and wants to keep yeah. fucking drinking and getting crazy. Well, let's go. I drank with the president of the United States. He's like, let's do shrooms now. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary's in bed. Why not? Hillary's at home. I don't want to go home. I want to do some meth. <laughs> Smoke some meth, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> 
Secret Service, give me some math. <laughs> Big Macs and math. <laughs> Big Macs and math. Oh, I'll take a Big Mac too, Mr. Secret Service agent. Fucking bring me some, two of those. No onions, of course, because I'm not a fucking whatever. Moving on. Ian, what else you got for us on this one? That's it. I think uh, I think I covered everything for this part. Dave, you got anything else? Any last thoughts? No. I'm intrigued. This is, uh, There's a lot of information in this episode. It's a lot of information. Hopefully, everyone I'm probably- looking forward to wrapping this up with part three. I, I, I like how it's structured. I like how we went through the bombing first. Mm-hmm. Kind and of the, the background information now, and I think it'll all be tied together next week. We... Uh, Oh, did we say this already? Maybe I'm too drunk. I don't remember. We we split this up into a third part because we didn't want to put too much information in one episode. We were told by some that Ruby Ridge was a little confusing and hard to follow. Uh, I didn't necessarily get that thought, but you know, some people did. So uh, because we had so many people and names in this part, we decided to break it up and make it a third uh, a third part so that we can kind of split the information so we didn't overload everybody at one time. So. Whatever. I they think it's good. Another, yeah, it's a good. It's a good. And, it's a good layout here. Looks like Oklahoma well, City and our uh, our our month on the federal government's going into June. Well, and you know the other thing too with part three is we still have to get into John Doe number two. Yeah, and that's a, a kind of a mini saga in and of itself. So yeah, it was a lot for to jam into one part. Ian, I used to call my penis John Doe number two, and I had to go <laughs> fuck all those interns. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me, brother? <laughs> I feel you, Mr. President. <laughs> John Doe number two wants to go up into your pooper. <laughs> so we have uh, Ian's first <laughs> name correction. <laughs> I just ignored that whole thing and just rolled into it. <laughs> so I got, I got business to take care of, guys. <laughs> I got to fucking get through this shit. I like to give it to her in the pooper. <laughs> I think it's super. <laughs> Is it super in the pooper? It's super in the pooper. That was, that was his campaign <laughs> slogan for 96, wasn't it? It's super in the pooper. It's super in the pooper. Clint- Bob, Bob Dole, I smoked you because it was super in her pooper. <laughs> Clinton 96. Best thing about that election was uh, probably Norm MacDonald becoming Bob Dole, right? Norm MacDonald did a great Bob Dole. <laughs> Hey, I'm not Mark Don- Norm McDonald, where's my pen? It's, it's sticking in his back. <laughs> Norm McDonald was great. Really and Bob Dole. It's funny <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> All right, so the uh, the name we have to uh, correct. Uh, shout out to M. Raquel. I believe Ian butchered your name on the uh, review. Fucking terrible, last week. Ian. Terribly offensive. Jesus. I never make mistakes on my names ever, ever, yeah. ever, ever. God damn. My apologies. Yeah. Well, shout out and thank you for the awesome review. We appreciate it. Now, if I was prepared further, here we go. Just bust it out, Mike. You can do it. <laughs> no preparation needed. Got some new patron <laughs> shout outs this week. Thank you. Uh, Just shout give out. it to her. Don't matter shout if she out. wants it or not. Just give it to her. <laughs> shout out to new $10 patron, Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Just fucking blow it on her, Mike. Just blow it on her. <laughs> All right, I gotta focus to get to these names. Just give her your load, Mike. This is give fucking. Your load. This is the. This is. <laughs> put that cohiba where you want to put it, Mike. <sighs> Mr. President, let me get to this, please. You wearing a blue dress, Mike? I might come over and see you later. <laughs> no, sir, I'm not. I, I'm not wearing my blue dress tonight. All right, Patreon shoutouts. Thank you very much to Priya Madali, Karen, Tamara McRae, Amy Toon, Morgan Dean. Brandon Lee, Mateo Thomas, Drew, Francesca Campbell, Sue Ann Valak, uh, Tanya Austin, Madison West, Ryan Doherty, Robin Pryor, 1234 Andreas with a Z, Alex Coronado, Sophie Reynolds, Tracy Linder, Ben Carras, Kyle Andrew Mooney, Rachel Adkins, Emily Howard, and Renata Macy. Thank you guys very much for signing up for Patreon. We appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Ian, what do you got? For iTunes, I have one for OG Blue Devil, Shamrock's Mom, Anon 9997799, Indie Chick 07, George the Serial Killer, and that cereal like the cereal you eat. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been known uh, to kill some cereal in our day. I'm about to do it in 10 seconds. 
<laughs> and Licia1291. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. Let's do a quick little uh, see if people are still fucking listening, because I think a lot of people tune us out when uh, of course we do. start getting to the end. Sure. But you know what? I'm going to throw in a fucking end conversation. I like it, Mike. Top three. Cere- Audible. Top three cereals. I'll go first if you guys need time. Uh, the, the, I can do I can do mine. Do it. And uh, start with three. I was going to start with one. You, or you don't even have to rank them. Just give me your three favorites. <laughs> I, was about to, I was about to start with one. Yeah, you guys are fucking, <laughs> that's so fucking insane. Like how, how, just give me, like, don't even rank them. Just give me, like, your three cereals that you enjoy. All right. I got them. Go ahead. Reese's Puffs. Okay. Lucky Charms and yep. Kicks, if I'm trying to be healthy. Ooh, Kicks. I like, of those three, I would, I would take Kicks. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is the greatest cereal Cinnamon Toast that has ever been created, mm-hmm. ever will be, or ever will be on the store shelf in any world. Cinnamon anything. Toast Crunch is good. It's the best it, ever. I don't think it's it's not in my top three, but it is the it leaves the best milk of any cereal. It is the best tasting milk of any cereal, is what I would say. It's Anyways. my one hundred percent favorite of all time. Okay, it's very good. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is delicious. I don't really eat cereal, though, so I don't know what else. Oh. <laughs> Can I just do a top one? I don't really well, eat, I don't, I don't eat cereal. Well, you're That's older, all I got. So what? You like, you like uh, uh, what's the little the frosted mini wheats? And you like raisin frosted bran. Mini frosted mini wheats. Frosted mini wheats and raisin bran. And golden grams are good. Golden grams is I don't awesome. really eat cereal, but I don't eat Cinnamon Toast Crunch is so fucking fantastic. It's really good. It's beyond reproach. Yeah. I really love a cinnamon toast crunch. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's gonna be interesting to see how many people actually have listened this far to hear out this conversation. You want to just do like an hour after show and see. Well, the what, problem what is people, people are gonna look at their little gimmicks on their their little phones and see that we did like twenty five minutes of us still talking, so uh-huh. they might tune in. The problem hmm. is it was after the shout outs, so really there's nothing left. You know, I'm gonna throw the social medias in right now. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We are at Necronomapod. Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. That being said, I'm going to give you my favorite cereals. Sue, let's just keep talking. I'm, I'm ready to drink for a long time tonight. So we'll go for like three <laughs> hours and record, and we'll see what happens. So in uh, third place, Frosted Flakes. I'm a big fan of Frosted Flakes. Yeah, okay. Second place, and this is going to make me an old person, Special K is delicious. I love Special K. It's terrible. And go it's ahead. It's not terrible. And number one, the greatest <laughs> cereal of all time, Fruity Pebbles. No? Fruity mm. Pebbles is fucking fantastic. It is the best cereal of all time. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and go. Lucky Charms on my third. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It can't be beat though. You can't ever make something better than I Cinnamon named Toast three Crunch. cereals better than it. No, I did. But it, it leaves the best milk. I will stand by that. But I don't. I don't I, pour my cereal for the milk. I'm gonna say runner up is Captain Crunch with the berries in it. Is I mean runner up. You already listed three. I'm just saying. What do you get extra? I, yeah, an honorable <laughs> mention now, motherfucker. <laughs> I actually prefer Captain Crunch without the berries, incidentally. Mm-hmm. Also, I don't eat Captain Crunch because I don't like the roof of my mouth fucking torn to shreds. Like good, what happens when you eat fucking cereal. Yeah. Or like it's, when you make those Stouffer's <laughs> French bread pizzas and you uh, eat it. You're like, oh, it's so hot, but I can't wait. I'm so hungry. Fucking tears and your For like a week, mouth it's out. all burnt. It's awful. It's not terror. It's not good. No. Yeah. Captain Crunch is delicious, but I refuse to eat it because I don't like my mouth torn to shreds. I hate when I'm eating some pussy and my mouth gets all, my, I get a canker sore on my side of my tongue. It's awful. Oh, God. I like to I like to do the alphabet when I'm eating some pussy. A, B, C, D, F, G. <laughs> Love it. It's great. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where to go from here. I think, I think that's it. Is that, what, is that all we got? I think that might be it. <laughs> All right. We gave them a little bonus <laughs> show hey, on cereal. Hey, FG, did you come yet? <laughs> <laughs> How far have you gotten in the alphabet, Mr. President, before they, they I, had actually came? I never, I never got past H. Those, those girls come right away. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cigar time. <laughs> oh. You guys suck the presidential cock now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. <laughs> Uh, anything else? We got anything else to add? Uh, no, I I'm, got nothing. No, that's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> I thought I heard Bill coming back up for a second. No, I think no. So. <laughs> I, think oh, so. I, think so. I, I love cinnamon toast crunch. The best thing out there going today. <laughs> 
better than Hillary's asshole. God damn, pal. <laughs> All, right. Oh, boy. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, motherfuckers. <laughs>